Hello, my name is Sebastian von Einsiedel. I'm the director of the United Nations University Center for Policy Research. It is my distinct pleasure today to welcome Ambassador William Swing, the head of the International Organization for Migration, IOM. Ambassador Swing, before um, taking over as head of IOM, has been for five years the head of uh, the UN's peacekeeping operation in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, MONUC, the largest UN peacekeeping operation in history. Before joining the UN, Ambassador Swing has had a distinguished career as a UN diplomat, as a US diplomat, serving in six ambassadorial posts, including in distinctly uncushy positions in Liberia, Haiti, Nigeria, Congo, DRC, and South Africa. Uh, Ambassador Swing, welcome to UNU and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Ambassador Swing, um, let me ask you uh, um, the following question. IOM um, is an organization with a $1.5 billion operating budget that is responsible for 1 billion migrants hmm. worldwide. What is it among the multifaceted uh, issues that migration poses that keeps you up at night? What is your number one priority? There are so many challenges, but I, I would say right now my biggest concern is to try to find ways to save the life of migrants because too many migrants are dying along the migratory route, both uh, in the sea and in the desert and elsewhere. We've documented the deaths of 40,000 migrants since the year 2000, 22,000 in the Mediterranean alone. Last year, 5,000 died, which was double the number who died in 2013. And this clearly needs to stop. It need not be but it's uh, going to have to change uh, in, at the level of policy if we can stop this. Now, the um, response by politicians when faced with refugee flows is often to call for tighter border controls. Yet many in the migration community would argue that these efforts are A, bound to fail, and B, that hardened borders is what lies at the root of the increased numbers of migrant death. Do you agree? I think we obviously are in a period where not only do we have the largest human mobility in recorded history, but we have also the largest, uh, the most widespread anti-migrant sentiment that we've seen in uh, decades. And clearly by building more walls, tightening visa regimes, and trying to restrict movement, is simply not working. That's why we have all these deaths at the sea and in the desert. So I would say that what we need are more legal avenues of uh, migration. We need to address the root causes of uh, involuntary migration. And don't forget that we now have 50 million forced migrants, the most since the Second World War. All of that has to change, and it can only change through policies and attitudes. And one of the big problems is that we have forgotten the historically positive nature of migration, and we're in a period now where the migration narrative is imminently toxic. Now, you have mentioned that in the Mediterranean alone, there were over 4,000 uh, migrant deaths in 2014. Um, in response to one particularly grisly event in 2013, when um, over 300 mm -hmm. migrants died in near Lampedusa, um, Italy mounted a, uh, a naval search and rescue operation that has since been taken over by the European Union. Now, some European governments refuse to contribute and pay for this operation because they argue it actually encourages irregular migration encourages irregular migrants mm -hmm. to endeavor this very dangerous um, uh, path across the Mediterranean. Um, do they have a point? Well, let's take the last period of time since the 1st of January. Close to 4,000 people have tried to cross the Mediterranean. There was no Italian naval operation. There was no Mare Nostrum. So why did they come? They came because of 
push factors as opposed to a pull factor. Now, in point of fact, what the Italian operation did, we must commend. They've saved 170,000 lives since October 2013 until the end of 2014. Now, those people now will not have this opportunity. Their lives will be lost. There will be no option left for them. So it has to continue. The difficulty with Operation Triton is, it is they don't have the mandate to save life. They have a mandate to protect borders. They don't have the assets. They have six ships compared to 32, and they don't have the budget. So it simply will not be a viable replacement. Along similar lines, um, the United States, Australia, and some other countries have introduced policies that would process migrants either in their countries of origins, uh, offshore, or in third countries. Meanwhile, in Europe, there are discussions underway to establish migrant processing centers in North Africa. Is that a solution? Well, we actually were at the heart of that proposal. Both UNHCR and IOM proposed the establishment of migrant processing and reception centers, pr principally in Libya. Now, you understand why that's not working, because Libya is sufficiently unstable now that you can't do that. But the idea would be you don't have to get on an unseaworthy vessel and take a risk uh, to cross the Mediterranean, because when you get to Lampedusa or Malta, you're going to go into a migrant processing center. So our point was, let's do this onshore in North Africa. Some of these people will qualify for protection under the 51 Convention. Some are clearly economic migrants, and a number of these would probably need to be sent back. And some, of course, are going to join their families in Scandinavia, particularly from Syria. But why take the risk in the Mediterranean when you could be processed there? But that is somewhat different from the other instance you mentioned uh, in Australia. That's a different op operation. Uh, how is it different? Well, in Australia, the, uh, the objective, as I understand it, is to keep any boats from landing in Australia itself. So they're taken to places such as Nauru, and now there is a proposal to move these, those who wish to go to move them from Nauru to Cambodia. But that's somewhat different than what we propose to the Europeans for North Africa. You've argued before that sealing borders is not the right way forward. What is the solution? One are the migration processing centers. Another is to create more legal avenues. A third one is something that European is engaged in now, which is a dialogue with the African Union in something that's called the Khartoum process, where countries of destination and origin work at this issue together. Those are all ways to handle this. Uh, but I think until we recognize that the, the whole situation has changed incredibly. And Europe, which has been a continent of origin for four centuries, has now become, for the last four decades, a continent of destination. And that requires psychological and political adjustments that simply haven't happened. Well, one problem you're facing is that politicians around the world uh, tend to show very little sympathy for the plight of migrants. How do you address that problem? Two ways. Number one, we have to get back to the historical basis of migration, which migration has always been historically positive. They brought in new ideas. They brought in high motivation. They have contributed across the board. They're not just getting access to public services they go in and they contribute financially. So we have to start to change that narrative. But secondly, I think countries that are not traditional migrant countries are going to have to learn to manage inexorably growing economic, social, religious, and ethnic diversity. Because with an aging North and an unemployed youthful South, people are going to arrive who don't look or speak exactly as you do but who might be brought to share the same values if they're properly welcomed and integrated. Now, it's a long stretch, I realize. Mayors understand this better than national politicians, and so we will be trying to bring the mayors together uh, in October this year to share ideas with one another as to how we can make this work at the grassroots level. I think that's what has to happen. Yet you're facing a rather unconducive trend of rising 
anti-immigrant sentiment around the world and especially in Europe that has only increased in the context yeah. of the spread of ISIS. How do you counter that? Well, first of all, we have to recognize that these, these, are, these are fears that people have. It's fears coming out of the global uh, economic downturn of 2008, a uh, fear of loss of jobs. It's the fear that arises, the main one you're mentioning, from the post 9-11 uh, security syndrome. And it is also a reaction against globalization, the fear of the loss of personal or national identity. We have to deal with all of this. But we, to do this, we have to knock down the stereotypes. Uh, there is nothing on the record that shows that migrants have more of a criminal tendency or a criminal record than nationals, not at all. It's usually the opposite. There's no stereotype there that says that migrants are bringing disease in. So all of these have to be changed, and that's going to take a long process. How you do it, governments have to take the lead. They have to have public education and public information programs. And for that, you have to have political courage, which unfortunately is in short supply. Now, amidst all <laughs> this focus on the concerns of the rich countries, we often forget that uh, over 85% of refugees and irregular migrants tend to end up in the developing world, especially yeah. in countries that are bordering crisis regions, in particular uh, those around Syria. What are the implications of that? Well, the implications are that every, every uh, local problem, national problem, immediately becomes regional overnight. The second thing is, we, we simply have to recognize that we have more forced displacement than at any time since the Second World War. You have 16.7 million refugees. Average time in a camp is 17 years. We have too few countries that are prepared to become resettlement countries, and those that are resettlement countries don't have large enough quotas. So the other countries are left to hold this uh, burden, and we're not sharing the responsibility with them. They need help. I, I went to Jordan and Lebanon, and I, I, I said I came here worried about Syria, and I returned worried about Lebanon and Jordan. They're each hosting more than a million refugees. And Lebanon only has four million inhabitants. Four million inhabitants. And so when people tell me in a population area of 500 million, which is, which is the European Union, we have 160,000 people who came north, I say, yes, but that's manageable. Whereas in Lebanon, it's becoming less and less manageable. You need to keep it in perspective. Indeed. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about migration and development. Uh, remittances mm -hmm. is a particularly important factor here. Indeed, remittances outstrip ODA by a factor three to one. And it is, of course, particular particularly against this background that IOM has uh, long lobbied um, for a reduction in costs of remittance right. transfers, right. including in the discussions around the post-2015 development mm -hmm. framework. Um, now, it seems to me that those efforts are threatened by um, anti-money laundering effort, the focus on counterterrorism financing. Are you concerned? I think this is a, a red herring. I think that the money that's going back is going to put food on the table, put children in school, and take care of the sick and the elderly. We have no evidence that it's being misused. My larger concern is exactly the one you mentioned. People are paying too much money to get their money home. 12 to 15 percent is not reasonable. And certain areas like Africa are particularly affected. They have even higher charges. Now, if you have $450 billion a year, which as you say is two or three times that of ODA, and you lose, say, 10%, you've lost $45 billion. So we're in touch with the private sector and with the Universal Postal Union to do pilot projects in places in Africa and South America to try to bring those costs well below 5%. And I think through the Postal Service, through mobile phone transfers, it can be brought down. Because otherwise, I think uh, they're paying too high a price. Great. A question on the plight of migrant workers, their exploitation in some parts of the world yeah. has been likened to modern slavery. Mm -hmm. 
What can be done about that? The first thing, you have to start at the beginning, the recruitment agencies. They go to a recruitment agency. A young woman, for example, is told, you're going into a nice household in this or that country. They arrive, passports taken away, they go into a brothel. A young man comes along and they say, we've got you a very good job in this country, arrives there, passport taken away, and the first year or two years of salary goes back to the recruitment agent. This is criminal and it has to stop. So we've begun to develop an international code of conduct. We hope that countries uh, and private sector companies will subscribe to this. If we can do this, we'll be able to bring an end to what I think is criminal, uh, irresponsible recruitment activity by agents. Excellent. We've talked a lot about international migration. Now, domestic migration mm -hmm. is a much greater phenomenon with over 700 million domestic migrants around the world, much of which takes the form of um, urbanization. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the risks and opportunities of um, urban migration, in particular in developing and middle-income countries? Well, you're absolutely right. Well over 90% of all the migrants, whether they come from the most remote part of the world, end up in cities. So the weight falls on the city council and the mayors to try to, to regulate this problem. Now, I think the, many of the same pressures that bear, uh, are brought to bear by international migrants apply also to domestic migrants. China alone has more domestic migrants than there are international migrants. It's too, close to 250 million. Now, when you come from the poor western regions of China and you come to the coastal cities of Guangzhou or Hong Kong or Shanghai, you're suddenly thrown into the same kind of pressures that an international migrant. If you go to Guangzhou, you have to learn another language. You have to learn Cantonese. So the pressures are pretty much the same, and I think some of the same policy lessons can be applied. They're, they will need help. Uh, they'll need support from the local community. And the local community will need to be educated as to why these people need to be accepted and integrated. So it's not entirely different. Uh, the difference may simply be uh, in, uh, they don't, maybe don't have the language difference, but the other things are the same. Ambassador Swing, it has been a great pleasure talking to you. You've done a great job in explaining a highly complex, complicated issue to our viewers. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me.